All right. So thank you, everyone, to, uh, for attending tonight's event, um, Exploring Cultural Differences Through Wrestling, um, hosted by Jedi Chicago and the Indiana Subchapter. Um, so for this event tonight, we have two guest speakers, uh, Tamaya uh, Greenlee and Ronnie Big Bang Nicole. And um, they're going to talk to us about, you know, what the, what the sport of professional wrestling is all about, um, you know, common misconceptions, because, you know, there's a lot of people who don't, you know, understand a lot about wrestling, myself included. Um, and they're also going to talk about their experiences from an athlete's perspective and a fan's perspective um, about wrestling in general, as well as um, wrestling in Japan. Um, and so, yeah. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, Jamila, who will um, introduce our speakers. Hi, everyone. Um, our first speaker is Ronnie Big Bang Nicole. She's an international professional wrestler who's been invited to Japan on multiple long-term contracts. She's going to talk to you about professional wrestling from an athlete's perspective. Um, yeah, and to have at it, Ronnie. Thank you for having me, Camilla and Alexis. Thank you, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it really is an honor to share my experience with you all. Uh, we are connected through Japan, and it's somewhere that I honestly um, I love and can't wait to return once it's safe to do so. Um, it's been a incredible experience being able to practice the art of professional wrestling in a different country. Um, so thank you guys for having me. So I know that this is all about teaching. So we're going to learn a little bit of something real quick. So most people know wrestling through WWE because they're the most recognized. But um, professional wrestling actually earliest depictions were from 2400 BC found in a Mastaba tomb in Saka. So wrestling is one of the only still practice sports that has ties all the way back to the beginning of our civilization, which for me is very impactful and ties me to a deeper and richer culture by what we're doing. Ancient Egypt was uh, 2500 BCE and there were paintings of wrestlers, hieroglyphics, they had wrestlers on cups and plates and all sorts of things that they found once they started um, going back on these big archeolog excuse me, archeological digs. And they found all of these different depictions of wrestling holes, moves and things that were translated into the grappling and the professional wrestling that we know of today. Even the ancient Sumerians depicted wrestling, which everyone knows Sumeria is modern day Iraq. And there were actual little sculptures, bronze sculptures found uh, with people in wrestling positions and different holes and things that we still use as wrestlers to this day. So a lot of people associate um, wrestling with Greco-Roman, which is true, but it actually has those deeper roots. The origin's often disputed, but it does have those deeper, deeper roots across the world, truthfully. Um, Greek poet Homer and Pindar both mention wrestling, professional, well, not professional wrestling, but wrestling in their work, in their historical work. And Pindar specifically uh, described the story of Zeus and Kronos actually wrestling to see who would reign supreme in the universe. Zeus won, and so for a while there was a holiday that was celebrated because Zeus won the grappling uh, bout with Cronus for um, for all the Greeks and the Romans, um, or excuse me, the Greeks. So um, everyone is familiar also with Plato. Most people did not know he was a wrestler. He was originally named uh, Arist Aristocles. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm butchering that. Um, but he changed it to Plato because he became such a well-known grappler and wrestler during his time. Um, they changed it because Plato means broad shoulders. And if you look at any pictures of him, dudes like Jack. Like, so he would actually be very well-renowned and not only for his poetry and his uh, educational teachings, but for his athletic prowess as well. Um, and as early as 708 BCE in the Olympics, wrestling was around. So it was actually one of the first times that wrestling winners were documented in any sort of professional bout of some sort. Um, the Greeks were credited, as I mentioned, with the conception of wrestling, but wrestling was in Egypt and Ni Niger and Senegal and South Africa and Europe. So it seems that wrestling kind of picked up uh, with a journeyman itself and every country, continent that it touched, it changed and was altered just a little bit. Um, the oldest known form of wrestling in Africa, uh, specifically in Senegal, is LAM, L-A-A-M-B. And it's more brutal and a little bit more ceremonial than the 
the wrestling that people know, either grappling or collegiate style, or even the professional wrestling you recognize today, because there was that religious component and wrestling and grappling was actually built into their culture, um, they would wrestle at the end of the harvest, like to kind of see who was the strongest um, and as a celebration of all of the harvest that they had brought in. Wrestling began to change um, following the Greek conquest of Egypt, and that was in 30, 30, 332. And then they were, when the Romans came later, um, it took wrestling from more of a brutal form to grapple. Early wrestling was akin to a lot of judo throws or moves just because it was based on strength and leveraging someone's body weight. So it was definitely a lot more intense and steeped in a lot of more hard contact style that actually stayed uh, in some countries like Japan, whereas it was altered here in the United States. Um, by the time the modern Olympic Games came around, wrestling had gone through most of the major civilizations and had had over 4,000 years of tuning and tweaking and adding and changing and had really evolved into something completely unique that was starting to gain a lot of popularity everywhere. So from the historical to a little bit earlier time or later time, um, here in America, uh, kind of pre-Columbus, wrestling was already here. Indigenous tribes were wrestling even before Christopher Columbus arrived. And it was very popular in North and South America, and South America wrestlers are known as luchador or luchador. Um, and around 1830, that's when professional wrestling actually got a foothold and started to be promoted as an event for a draw. And this was because of Jean Eboyat, uh, he was a French guy, he was a showman, and he actually got a bunch of collegiate wrestlers out, and he was like, hey, you guys want to make money? And they were like, yeah, why not? So they traveled around France and put on wrestling performances, and this was kind of the first time that people had seen wrestling organized and built into some sort of spectacle. So this was the genesis, almost, of professional wrestling promotion. And so the first ever wrestling tournament was held in 1888 in New York which is why New York is one of the uh, places that has a really strong wrestling history because of how many people from Europe and other countries were coming during, uh, immigrating to New York and bringing their different styles of wrestling to where already wrestling had a really strong foothold. And so you have a lot of schools and promotions that have been around, not for like 200 years, but for a long time, just based on the historical context of wrestling being so strong there. Around the nation, wrestling was very strong up in the northeast, uh, the south, uh, in the mid-south, and out in the northwest, so, and California. So, and that's the actual holdover from what I'm going to go into next. But pro wrestling became more popular uh, here in, uh, in the United States after the Civil War, because everyone was bad. And so they started putting on exhibitions and bouts at fairs and carnivals. And even after the Civil War, uh, or even past uh, people who fought in the Civil War were drawn to professional wrestling. And so you had soldiers who would bring a lot of people because they knew them to these wrestling bouts. And that's kind of how things uh, promoting by word of mouth got around about all of these events. The two most famous wrestlers during this time were Frank Gotch. He was actually uh, one of the grandfathers of professional wrestling and Martin Burns. And at the time, they were the main draws. If people knew that Frank Gotch was going to be on a show or Martin was going to be on a show, they could definitely bring in a lot of people. And so it was more of a festival or a fair atmosphere, less like you see right now where people are going into a sit down arena. It was more, you know, people milling about and coming to see these different bouts. Um, about that time, the word was uh, boxing was neck and neck in popularity. And because pugilism had come over, there were a lot of famous European pugilists who were here that had made uh, boxing very popular. And so it is not confirmed, but it is rumored that a lot of the boxing promoters put out the word that wrestling was fake and sick in order to deter people from being interested in wrestling and going to shows, which actually kind of messed up wrestling because it was only the word of mouth promotion and maybe something in a newspaper or a little playbill, but it wasn't the way that we promote now. And so Ed Lewis, Billy Sandow, and Tootsmont 
they were called um, the Gold Dust Trio. These guys got together. They knew wrestling was scripted to a degree. And they were like, that's okay. We're going to make some changes. And so they were really the beginning of the ones who made it a promotion, started running storylines, started the heel tactics, which would be the bad guy cheating tactics, adding the uh, ideas of DQs and time limits. And so this is where wrestling started to really evolve into what we saw. Um, and by the 1930s and 40s, it wasn't in the fairs anymore. It wasn't, you know, in, out on farms and stuff. They were actually transitioning to a real business model. And so that's when you start getting into the modern professional wrestling that we know of today. And so they formed NWA, which is the National Wrestling Alliance. And this was honestly done to help save the business because there were so many different promotions. No one knew what they were doing. It was really the wild, wild west. And so they wanted structure and to be able to capitalized on the money because it was very popular and lucrative at the time. And so this was the beginning of what we know as the territory days. And so that worked for a while, but wrestling is a contentious and ego-filled sport. <laughs> and so that got the better of a lot of those who were involved during that time. And so by 1957, people were breaking from the NWA model. They wanted to do their own thing. They didn't want to have to keep putting the belt on Luces. They were upset that he was um, their champion. Um, and so because of all the backstage politics, we move into the golden age of wrestling when we have three different promotions and they are the ones who are just running the entire country in terms of what professional wrestling looks like. And so the rise of television also increased everything that was going on in terms of professional wrestling and it being more widespread and people were seeing people, you know, in the 1950s, as people were getting television, they would see these wrestling uh, stars on TV and it really gave more of a a grandiosity to the sport. And that is where the elevation of characters and uh, interest music and, and kind of high flyers, that's where you start to get more into the theatrics. And we begin to transition out of the athletic actual competition part and more into the showmanship part. And that was in great part due to Antonio Rocca and Gorgeous George. Gorgeous George was actually the first wrestler to have a ballet, which is a female uh, manager or assistant, if you will, <laughs> uh, to walk to the ring with him, as well as one of the first wrestlers to use interest music as he came to the ring. So now we're getting more into the, it's on TV, we have to make it a different production, because back in the day, there was nothing. Everyone had to go to the entertainment. So they had to kind of evolve the style. And so at the time, NWA was still around, but they had offshoots, AWA, as well as WWWF, which is the oldest iteration of WWE that we know now. And so during this time, there was a lot of talent switching. It was great for wrestling. You know, everyone had their own company, but there was, there was lots of wrestling all around, and they were building a lot of superstars. And then um, Hulk Hogan pops on the scene in the 70s, and just everyone goes crazy over him. And moving into the 80s, that's when you get into um, Titan Wrestling, or Titan Sports, excuse me, which was founded by Vince McMahon uh, Jr. And then in 82, Vince McMahon Jr. bought um, WWWF from his father. And that's where you have the beginning of the end in terms of the territory days and how wrestling was depicted. So I keep mentioning territory days. At that time, the different areas I mentioned to you across the nation were split into territories. So there would be a group of maybe three to five states that would work together with the same kind of core roster of wrestlers, run storylines, and use their promotions to kind of keep everyone employed and everyone entertained. And so wrestlers would maybe have a feud going, and they would go to maybe six to ten cities within that sector and do their matches and build that story up to the big championship match. And then they would, you know, it would be a big, huge deal. And that whole territory would know that or the whole nation would know that that territory's champion was this individual. So that's kind of how things worked up until this point. Big Kick Man came in and uh, decided he didn't want to do that. And so <laughs> this had never been done before, but he invaded other promotions. Uh, he syndicated WWF in the territories of other people, which was unheard of, and he made money off of the merchandise he was selling in these other territories, and he stole talent. And so he pretty much came and just ripped the tablecloth out, and all the dishes went with it. And because he had the machine of so much history with his company behind him and so much prominent talent, he became a juggernaut and so honestly put a lot of other companies out of business and that is one reason why WWE is the most recognized brand today 
Um, but there are still a bunch of other fantastic brands. You have TNA Wrestling, which is Impact Wrestling, Ring of Honor. Um, you have AEW uh, starting up, uh, or well, you know, it's, it's one of the newer, larger companies. So wrestling itself has a long and arduous journey to get where it is and continues to evolve and grow to this day. In Japan, wrestling was a little bit later caught on because it was originally sumo and judo that was the grappling style there. So wrestling came a bit later. Um, Matsuda Sorokichi was the first pro wrestler. He was a sumo wrestler, but he's the first pro wrestler that they recognized to transition over, or excuse me, sumo wrestler to transition over to pro wrestling. And it became, again, more popular after World War II because everyone felt like trash. And so with the rise of people wanting to be entertained, you had um, Ricky Dozan who made the sport more popular. Um, he was the first one to kind of stage matches and his whole thing with the matches was Japanese homeland against the evil foreign invaders, which I can attest is the booking style still to this day to a small degree. <laughs> Um, but that carried over and really ignited the popularity of wrestling in Japan. Um, and so the Japan Pro Wrestling Alliance was started in 1953, and they patterned themselves after what NWA did here in the States. Um, but by the early 1960s, the same things happened in Japan that happened here. There were a lot of people who were dissatisfied and wanted to do their own thing. And so they broke off and became their own federation. So Tokyo Pro Wrestling and International Wrestling Enterprise for the men. By the time the 70s rolled around, <laughs> excuse me, you had New Japan and All Japan, and all of these places were cranking out talent in a really um, old school sumo training, judo martial arts training style. So Japan became very well known because their training style was so much more rigorous and the wrestling style was so much more intense. Japan's wrestling style is kind of carries over from that original um, iteration of wrestling where it is more brutal and more contact filled, not based so much on storyline and um, the theatrics, so to speak. Um, and so in the 19th, but in the 1970s, all Japan uh, women's pro wrestling came on the scene. And that was really, that was the beginning of the Joshi pro wrestling, uh, female pro wrestling in Japan movement. Um, most well-known uh, veterans or senpai wrestlers in Japan, female wrestlers, uh, went through all Japan. And so their foothold was very strong from the 70s into the 90s. And by the 1990s, everybody loved Joshi wrestling and everybody was on the Japanese craze. Um, it became so popular. Um, people were actually bootlegging uh, the media from Japan and sending it here. I actually was the recipient of two of those bootleg Japanese masters. <laughs> um, and so, like, there were a lot of amazing women at the time Jaguar Yakota, Jaguar Yakota, uh, Shigusa Nagayo, and Lioness Asta, the Crush Gals, um, Jackie Sato, Dump, uh, Matsumoto. Um, Gosh, so like the rise in popularity of women in wrestling really brought all of these things to the forefront and showcased their um, physicality just as much as the men. And so you had tremendous matches like Aja Kong versus uh, Manami Toyota, Yoko Inou versus Mariko Yoshida, uh, Mayumi Ozaki versus Takako Inou. So like all of these women were at this point have been wrestling 20 plus years and had the same style of vigorous training that the men did, which really elevated the bar for wrestling across the world because it set Japan differently um, from other places. So history aside, the biggest difference that I found as a professional wrestler between is the training styles as well as the performance styles. Um, here in America, we I was trained old school. I was trained by C.W. Anderson, Lou Marconi, um, Tony Hankton James, and Eddie Brown. And they are all, oh, and Chili Willie from ECW. And so they're all very old school wrestler guys. So a lot of grappling, a lot of holds, um, very good guy versus bad guy in terms of storytelling. Whereas in Japan, it's a lot about your body conditioning and being able to do a lot of hard hitting and impactful moves, sequences of moves uh, for a long amount of time. And so there's definitely more of a focus on making sure your body is a particular tool that you need it to be 
Whereas here in America, it's more about how much of a character you are, how much um, emotion that you can elicit from the crowd, and that's called getting over, and how much you sell merchandise-wise. I mean, that's, that's in Japan too, but essentially here, the more focus is on how much money you're going to make the company. Um, so when, while I was in Japan, I wrestled for World Women Pro Wrestling Vienna and Marvelous. So Vienna was run by Kyoko Inou and Marvelous was run by Shigusa Nagayo. I spent four years in total in Japan. Um, all of my tours were quite long. They really don't do tours like that anymore, um, especially now with COVID. They're definitely more strict about travel. Um, it was an eye-opening experience as a queer Afro-Latina from the South to transition all the way across the world to Japan. Uh, to say culture shock was an understatement. Uh, <laughs> The work ethic, uh, as you all know, in Japan is very high and it's very um, intense, and that is definitely no different in terms of your professional wrestlers and your athletes there. So training was six days a week uh, for no less than four hours, but no more than eight. So depending on how vigorous everyone was feeling that day, um, I actually trained with them in Vienna in the morning. And then I would train with uh, Seedling, which is a different organization run by Nana Kakashi, um, in the evening. So my training day was from about nine to seven or eight, uh, with a break in between. Uh, <laughs> so between all of the training, um, we ran six miles every morning. We jump rope for 30 minutes straight. We did, by the end of my tour, I was doing a thousand squats every morning. Um, all of the physical roles and, and the bumps, the falls in the ring, we would do that for at least an hour. Um, and body conditioning, and this was all before we did any sort of grappling or any sort of moves or learning anything that you see when you watch wrestling on television. Um, <laughs> it was definitely, I was put through the paces. Uh, I honestly didn't realize how intense the training was going to be. I was told to train before going, so I did do that. Um, but the training was really intense and crazy and and fun and awesome. But there is a, a hierarchy that they adhere to in Japan, especially as a senpai, uh, a senior wrestler or senior member of the organization, and a kohai, which is the lower members of the organization. Because I was born, I was not considered kohai as much, but I still had to do kohai things. Uh, so after for shows, we have to pack all the senpai's clothes. You have to load all of that stuff into the car. You travel to the venue. You have to set up the ring. You have to bring all of the stuff that you're going to need for the show. Set up all the merchandise. Set up all the uh, your simpai's gear and their makeup or whatever. Um, and then you have to be second, which means you're ringside during the matches. If somebody, you know, you cheer them on, you boo, you give them water, you make sure the ropes are secure. Um, it's kind of like an auxiliary position. Um, I was known as the best second. Uh, it's very, always very animated and excited for my, for the people I was having to work with and for. Um, but yes, they take that very seriously. The senpai take care of the kohai. So after the show, they would take us out to dinner um, and make sure, you know, we had everything that was needed. Whereas here in America, my trainers were kind of like, okay, you're trained. Baby birds are off the nest. And I was like, I don't know how to fly. So... <laughs> I prefer Japanese style just because it is more hands-on and you know you can go back to your trainer. Um, I was very, very blessed at Vienna and at Marvelous, um, but especially with Vienna. Uh, Alno Keiko, who was my closest trainer, as well as Kaoru Ito, who I thought hated me literally for the first three months. But then uh, I realized that was just her, her way. Uh, she, she showed up with a gift one day and I was like, thank you and i was like i thought she really hated me but that they're very you have to earn the trust and the respect of the senpai because of how much it is to be a professional athlete there um i will say it was challenging with the racial aspect of being a wrestler in a foreign country and people never seeing anyone like me <laughs> or being exposed to that um, so I did have to educate kindly about a lot of the misconceptions uh, coming from the West about minorities, which honestly helped the wrestling community because after my first tour, that's when they actually allowed more minority women wrestlers over. Prior to me coming, only Aja Kong, or excuse me, Amazing Kong, 
had been over as a foreign African American talent. And so opening those doors and crossing those those lines in order to kind of educate because we both love to do this. Um, and we, we all have a, a shared connection to this rich history of wrestling. Um, that was a really great experience uh, for me to be able to do that. Challenging, but great. Um, but yes, uh, I got to wrestle um, all of the women I mentioned. I actually got to be in the ring with at one point or another. I was second, usually for Jaguar Yakota. She actually specifically asked for me uh, to be first in her co-high, which was amazing because she is legendary. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that was a really big deal for me, um, and I felt very honored to, you know, to work so closely with so many tremendous people who have impacted wrestlers around the world. If you ask anyone top five matches of in the world, they're going to mention the match with Manami Toyota. Um, and so it's really, I feel very fortunate to have spent so much time there, to have gone through that rigorous training, and to really have built a very strong fan base and career there. And to learn so much about uh, Japanese history and culture. Um, so yes, yeah, just very quickly, if you could hit the slide, oh, because I just realized I didn't see any of those. Um, these are just some photos. So um, me in the center, you guys may recognize. Um, oh, could you go back up a little? Yeah. Um, the girl in red uh, is Sari. She uh, is actually in, or they call her Sare now in WWE. Um, this group photo was from a Deanna show. And in the right, I kind of went out of order, but in between the photo of Sari and um, the group photo, that's myself and Kyoko Inoue. Um, if you could scroll down. Um, and so the picture in the center is myself with um, Manami Toyota and the far, far side, that's Aja Kong who is uh, half black, half Japanese, and very well respected uh, in Japan, uh, a legendary senpai. Um, uh, keep going down. Yeah, keep going to the next one. Sorry, one moment. It won't let me okay. go down any farther than that. I think that's all that there was. Okay, it should have been nine, but that's okay. But I will wrap. Um, yes, I will wrap. Um, thank you guys for letting me share history and Japan with you. Um, definitely, any questions you have, I know I cut the Japan part a little short, uh, but any questions you have, I know that we're having Q&A later, and I'll pass it to Tamaya. Well, Alexis, or I'm passing it on. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, and yeah, Jimmy will give a brief introduction for you. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, I dropped the iPad. Um, thank you, Ronnie. That was excellent. I, I have a ton of questions. So when question time comes. Next, we are going to hear from Tamaya Greenlee. She's a 2016-18 Ishikawa Jet alumni and longtime Indiana resident. She's also an up-and-coming wrestling announcer and is going to talk to you about wrestling from a fan's perspective. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you so much uh, to Ronnie Big Bang Nicole. That was amazing hearing your training regiment um, because I don't know, well, I don't think anyone else here is a huge wrestling fan, but there's a really famous documentary on women's wrestling in Japan um, where they're training. Um, and I've always been curious how much of that um, has uh, stayed the course. Um, nine to seven is no joke. Okay, um, sorry, I'm getting ready to share um, my presentation. Sorry, I haven't shared from Zoom before. So there it is. I'm used to Microsoft Teams. Um, is everyone able to see that? We're good? Okay, so 
I won't be able to see you anymore. So if you need to stop me for any reason, um, just go ahead and yell. All right. So hi, I am Tamaya Greenlee. I was an Ishikawa Jet from 2016 to 2018. Um, specifically in Nonoichi. This is a picture that I took actually, um, let me see, a, a few months before I went to Japan. Um, so this was a couple days before my graduation. Um, I went to a show in Chicago that Ring of Honor did um, with New Japan. Um, at the time, I had been a lifelong pro wrestling fan uh, I usually say probably around 95. I was really young when my dad started renting tapes of old WWF shows um, and I was hooked from there. Uh, and since then, I just needed any kind of wrestling I could get my hands on, not knowing how in trouble I was when I realized that's a lot of wrestling. Um, so around this time, I had just started getting into Japanese pro wrestling. Um, I had seen some matches here and there uh, because as a wrestling fan, of course, you hear these legendary names um, and you see people coming in from other promotions to wrestle for American audiences. But I started following New Japan Pro Wrestling and I was thrilled at this show because I was able to meet my favorite pro wrestler, um, Naito. So... I think this is a, I don't know, fun little, fun little picture considering what I didn't know would happen afterward, um, which would be my interesting adventure with pro wrestling. So if you're not familiar with Ishikawa, um, I always like to tell people um, and hope that they don't call me off, call me out on my uh, geography, that if they know Tokyo, just go all the way to the other coast and we're about right there. Um, so I was, again, in Nonuichi, but it's kind of a blurred line with Kanazawa because it's maybe like a 15-minute ride over, um, and then you're in the city. Uh, and to be honest, these pictures are a lot more aesthetically pleasing than what I could find of Nonuichi. Um, so we've got the beautiful Kanazawa Castle and Hidorokuin. And this is where I called my home away from home for two years. So going into the first show, I think that it's important to say my knowledge about pro wrestling in Japan um, was non-existent. So I went in thinking that pro wrestling in Japan would be just like in America. Um, and in America, it's pretty easy to find shows more or less. Um, a lot of social media advertising, uh, so events on Facebook, uh, different websites will have the schedule. Um, if you follow certain wrestlers, they'll share where they're going to be wrestling at. Uh, so I just kind of expected that I would be able to go over and just see what shows were happening in my area. Um, I learned that that is not the case, uh, but somehow after being in Japan for some months desperately looking for wrestling, um, I came across probably um, a poster saying that there would be a show in um, Kanazawa. And so this is in November and it was a tag league match for New Japan Pro Wrestling, um, which you might remember from the previous picture was the promotion that I was just getting into. Um, so funny little <laughs> anecdote about this. Um, I actually got a really bad uh, cornea scratch um, the day before I, I went and I had to beg the, the doctor to let me go and wear a contact in my um, horribly swollen eye so I could actually see the show. Um, I'm pretty sure he thought I was crazy, but I got my contact and I saw the show and it ended up being a great time. Um, one thing that was different about this show uh, compared to what I would experience later, um, you can tell that I didn't know how things went because I ended up very far in the back. Um, I can't remember what row I was in. I might've been in like the sixth row or something. Um, but with experience, I learned that that did not have to be the way. So I had to figure a lot out because after that show, I knew I wanted to see more wrestling. Um, I wanted to see it as often as I could. 
and I knew I was still missing something. Um, I didn't know how to find shows. Um, I didn't really know how to find other promotions. Uh, at that time, I wasn't very knowledgeable about too many promotions outside of New Japan. Um, I had heard of a couple of them just from, again, as I said, wrestlers from other promotions, wrestling in places like Ring of Honor, um, PWG. Um, but I, I knew there was a lot more out there, including women's wrestling, um, that I just could not find. And so there are three things that probably would have helped me. So having a grasp on the language would have been really nice. Um, even a sense of direction when it comes to traveling um, and of course, confidence to get things done. However, that was not necessarily the case. <laughs> um, it was really my determination to see pro wrestling that brought everything together. Um, I went to Japan not knowing Japanese. Um, I still don't know as much Japanese as I should, but I'm a lot better. Um, I have a terrible sense of direction uh, still. Um, got me turned around a couple of times traveling in other prefectures. Um, and I don't know if my confidence is up there. I, I kind of uh, was winging it. But I, I do like to say that as I started getting the hang of how wrestling worked um, as a fan in Japan, um, everything else kind of came into play and it helped me um, enhance my experience. So one of the important things uh, that really changed everything for me, um, because a lot of people ask me how I managed to go to so many wrestling shows. Um, so it was in January, 2017, I made the meaningful resolution that I wanted to see a pro wrestling show um, at least once a month. Um, and I was able to do that sometimes more than that. Um, and one of the things that I found in my research um, was this awesome website that actually shows a calendar of all of the events that happen in Japan um, with wrestling. So it's every single promotion, every single prefecture. Um, and so this is an example from 2017. It actually let me go back and see what I would have been looking at at this time. Um, so it shows all the days um, and it has it stacked with who is playing where. Um, and if you can see on Saturday, that's a lot of pro wrestling. I mean, I would even say, uh, compared to the United States, looking at Wednesday and Thursday, that's a lot more, um, than you are likely to find, especially with shows, um, of, of from promotions of that kind of name, uh, value. Um, people always ask me if professional wrestling is popular in Japan, um, looking at the Saturday category alone, I think you can say, yes, it is. So another thing that this website allowed me to do, it allowed me to choose what prefecture I wanted to go to um, or what I wanted to look for shows in um, and also what promotions. So say I wanted to see what was happening in Ishikawa for the next couple of months, I could click Ishikawa and filter that and it would show me who was going to be there. Um, if I wanted to say, okay, I want to see if I can make a trip to Tokyo, um, I can find it there. Or if you are like me and you are a bit geographically challenged, um, you could do, okay, Ishikawa, Toyama, Fukui, Gifu. Um, again, very geographically challenged. I have learned the hard way that those are not all as close as I think they are in my head. Um, but it was a really good way to kind of organize my schedule based around wrestling, which is exactly how I live my life to this day. Um, and then that list at the bottom, that is every active wrestling promotion. Um, so that is men's wrestling, women's wrestling. Um, I think there might even be some MMA in there, but not too many. Um, so that's a ton. So another thing that I had to figure out was actually buying tickets. Um, so I, being a loyal Family Mart goer, um, I learned my machine very, very well um, and how to find wrestling. 
Um, and that was kind of where some of the language came in because you have to write it in Japanese and you have to be able to find what you're looking for in Japanese. Um, so I was able to test my reading skills and writing skills um, very early on. Um, so that is how you actually find the tickets and print them. Um, and then on the right is an example of what will come out. Um, you will get a ticket that looks like that. Travel was another hurdle that I had to get over. Um, so in the United States, uh, everywhere that you go is pretty much by car. Um, and as someone who doesn't drive, I have a lot of phobias around cars and driving. Um, it kind of keeps me restricted to certain areas. So I go to a lot of shows locally in Indianapolis, um, but I can't always go to Chicago as easily. Um, or if I want to see Ring of Honor in Nashville, um, you know, I might have to see if my brother is going. Um, am I good to go? Okay. Um, so I had to figure out how to get where I wanted to go. And luckily, um, Japan made that really easy. Um, Japan has bus travel, we have trains, Shinkansen being in um, Kanazawa, uh, we have that line that will let you get over to Tokyo in about three hours. Um, so I could go to just about any show I wanted to. Um, I didn't know that early on, but once I kind of figured out um, how the buses worked by asking questions, observing, things like that, um, I was able to utilize the night bus a lot, um, especially going to Osaka and Tokyo, um, going in the evening and getting at to Tokyo um, around six, just to wait it out until things came alive at nine in the morning. Um, I was able to use the train sometimes if the shows weren't um, going over too late. Uh, so I really learned how to travel in Japan um, all because of pro wrestling. And so one of the interesting things um, that comes in with my journey in pro wrestling is in the expat community, you're a lot closer than I think you realize at times. Um, I think for all of us who have been expats, um, you likely have an experience like that where you know that community um, is very important to your experience. And it was definitely important to my experience um, as a wrestling fan. Um, so one of my favorite little stories that I forget about is before I knew how to find wrestling shows, and when I was in the figuring it out stage, I'd actually gone onto a Facebook group for fandom and asked if anyone knew how to find pro wrestling shows. Um, and so one of these girls on the group messages me and she says, oh, I have a friend that's wrestling in Japan. Um, I can get you in contact with her and she can tell you how this goes. And I said, great. Um, and so I messaged her and I just asked, you know, I, I really want to see some wrestling shows and I'm not really sure how to get tickets or find shows. Um, and so she kind of explained a little bit to me. Um, fast forward some months later and I'm sitting in the audience and I look up and I realize that's the girl I was talking to. Um, I didn't know it at the time because my, my knowledge of pro wrestling, um, I, I knew a lot, but I didn't know as much about independent wrestling as um, I say I know now. It was pretty much restricted to some of the bigger indies. Um, but I had been talking to Chris Wolf on um, the bottom right the whole time. Um, and I didn't realize it. And I, I always thought that was kind of funny. Um, just one of those examples where, you know, another jet has a friend who happens to be in Japan. Um, and lo and behold, it's someone that you're seeing on the show. Um, other examples, uh, if you can see on the left, upper and lower pictures, um, I had a, a really funny <laughs> wrestling show acquaintanceship when I went to NOAA um, and one of the wrestlers, Cody Hall, 
um, we always stopped and said hi. Uh, it's kind of weird when you are the only foreign person um, in the audience um, and there's only a couple foreign wrestlers on the card. You have these moments where you walk past each other and there have been times when, you know, I'll look at someone, they'll look at me and we're both thinking the same thing, but we just kind of go our, our own ways. Um, but it was actually cool. Um, Cody and I just kind of chatted. And I, I think it all goes back to that whole expat experience where sometimes you really just want to talk to people who understand you easily, who kind of have the same thoughts um, and perspective uh, with your knowledge of how things go in America versus being in this new um, environment where the wrestling and the, um, I guess, fan culture is really the best way, aren't what we're used to. Um, so I always th thought that was fun. Um, and it, it, it made things a lot less, I wouldn't say stressful, um, but it's, it's nice having that kind of familiarity again when you are going somewhere where you're alone and you stick out in a lot of ways. Um, this time I was lucky to have uh, my wonderful friend Sarah with me, um, but a lot of times I just went to these shows by myself. Um, I didn't have friends who were wrestling fans um, and I just wanted to go see it. So if I didn't have someone to go with, I would just go by myself. And then of course, in the upper right-hand corner, um, we have a wonderful familiar face, Ronnie Big Bang Nicole. Um, and where our meeting comes from is we were actually part of the same expat group on Facebook for Black Women in Japan. Um, and so it's Black women who live in Japan for a number of reasons whether it is for work outside of teaching, um, jets, uh, you know, people who are contracted to other companies, people who are on the military bases. And it's really important because there are some times when you have experiences as a minority in Japan that other people can't quite understand, um, but you need that sense of community to one, kind of tell you that you're not crazy sometimes, um, but who also understand um, some of the culture that you come from. Um, and meeting Ronnie was a really great opportunity because she actually just posted that she had a show um, that was happening in Tokyo. And being a wrestling fan, I was like, okay, yeah, I, I would love to go. I was actually planning on going um, to another show in that area anyway. Um, and it was just an amazing talk, really like we already knew each other before we even knew each other. Um, at, uh, some would say, the greatest Japanese restaurant, TGI Fridays. Um, <laughs> we had a really good time. Uh, and I was actually looking back and I didn't realize that was the first trip that I made um, outside of Kanazawa to watch wrestling. Um, so it was to see Ronnie and to see a show that I was really excited for. Um, and of course, that relationship has lasted since then. And it's something that still means a lot to me. Um, and yeah. So there are also other situations as an expat that <laughs> sometimes go into the unusual territory. Um, again, it's this small community where when you need help, sometimes the only person you can turn to is another foreigner who knows um, how things run in the area. Um, so there are a lot of wrestlers who wrestle in Japan um, who come from the United States or other countries. Um, but unlike with Ronnie Nicole, sometimes there are shorter stays. Um, so if there's a tournament, for example, um, they might last throughout the tournament, but not come back as a regular. Um, so a lot of times people from outside promotions who have partnerships will do this. And so one of these examples was I went to a show by Pro Wrestling Noah in Kanazawa and I posted photos that I took uh, that Sunday and I wake up on Monday morning, I go to work. Um, it's another kind of desk warming day, nothing too exciting. And I get a message and the first thing it says is, you got car. So <laughs> it, it's still really confusing kind of. 
So what it was, was um, there was a wrestler from the show who I tagged in my photos who wanted to go to the gym, but he didn't know how to go to one or where to go. And no one from his company was helping him. Um, and so he reached out to me and it was a very bizarre, mundane morning. So <laughs> it was a lot of me sitting at my desk, trying to reach out to my friends to figure out, is there a gym? Um, I've heard of these things called gyms, but I am not very familiar with them. Um, so I did my best to ask my friend and we got a lot, a lot of answers. This conversation went on for so long of going back and forth, trying to direct him with um, bus routes, um, giving him the address. Maybe you could take a cab here. This is what you do when you get to the gym. All of these things. Um, and at the end of the day, <laughs> he messaged me a couple hours later. So it must have been like 11 probably. Um, that he found a place. So I did all that work and that was it. And I haven't spoken to him since. So sometimes <laughs> it gets strange like that. Um, so this is our beloved expat community. So in addition to kind of accepting that strange things like that happen, there are other things that I um, accepted as the new normal in professional wrestling um, shows. So in American professional wrestling shows, photography really isn't a big thing. And when I say photography, I'm talking about, um, you know, professional cameras, uh, DSLRs. A lot of people use cell phones. That's the norm. If you see someone with a camera, it's kind of unusual. Um, and in some places, you're not even allowed to have the kind of professional looking cameras like that. Um, but for Japanese professional wrestling, a lot of fans have professional cameras and really crazy lenses that they bring with them. Like I saw a guy with a briefcase of zoom lenses with him one time. Um, but it was seeing this and seeing the photos on Instagram that got me interested in uh, starting photography. That's actually the reason why I bought my camera that I still use today to take photos at wrestling shows. Um, another thing that is a bit unusual is outside food and drink is accepted, encouraged, and it gets interesting. So whereas in an American pro wrestling show, you might get, you know, nachos, french fries, um, hot dogs. Um, I've sat in a crowd before and I've thought, huh, why does it smell like fish? And you look and it's because someone pulled out fish that they bought earlier. Um, to snack on. Um, or if you're going to a place like Tokyo Dome, um, you know, you just come in with your beer and they'll pour it into a cup for you. Um, so that was one of the unusual things because usually in the US, it's all about spending your money there, um, which I guess is not the case. So you learn that if you're going to go to a show that's going to be three hours, um, I hope you went to the Konbini before and got your food. The audience was also a lot different than what I was used to. Um, so for one, and I'll talk about this more later, a lot more women in attendance. Um, there are a lot of stereotypes about what a pro wrestling fan looks like. Um, and I can guarantee you would not expect based on those who would be in the audience. So um, you get a lot of people coming off of work, you know, in their nice crisp, button down white shirt, um, their blazer. Um, you get a lot of people in their, you know, I'd say 20s to 40s, not too many kids, um, dressed nicely, not as many people who have, you know, you see people in wrestling shirts, but in the United States, the norm is that just about everyone there is dressed really casually, wrestling shirt, um, jeans, but if you go to a show in Japan, it's not uncommon to see someone in a nice dress or a nice skirt, um, heels even. Um, so it was a different crowd than I was used to. Um, <laughs> and some interesting characters as well. Uh, and also the ticket lottery system. 
um, which was the biggest thing that I learned. Um, and so I have a couple slides to show some of these things that I just spoke about. So this is one of the examples of the photography that I took at a NOAA show. Um, that gaze still haunts me. I was able to take photos that I still look at today, um, just logging my experiences at these different wrestling shows. Um, so it's a really precious memory to have. Um, and I love that I can always go back into that moment. Uh, so for this shot, it's not as easy to see, but you can see what the crowd looks like. Um, so one, everyone's sitting, uh, sitting very nicely. Uh, you can see a lot of women in the crowd. Um, you can see people are dressed pretty well. Uh, I only see one wrestling shirt there. Um, and this is pretty much the standard crowd um, at least for a men's wrestling show, especially for a New Japan show. Uh, for women's wrestling, the crowd tends to be um, a lot more male dominated. Um, you get women's sections at some of those shows just so that there's a comfortable space for women to sit. Um, but there's a lot more gender diversity than people would expect. So if you think of uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling as the biggest wrestling promotion in Japan. Um, a lot of people would say, you know, WWE would be an equivalent in the US. Uh, you're not as likely, um, in my opinion, to find that kind of makeup in the crowd that has so many women. Uh, this is an example of fan culture that is different in Japan that is sometimes adopted in the United States. Uh, so when there is a wrestler that is uh, usually marking a moment in their career um, or someone that you want to show respect for um, or adoration for, you will throw streamers. Um, in the United States, people will do that to show respect toward Japanese wrestlers who are visiting um, or even kind of mocking that tradition um, for American wrestlers. Uh, so in one promotion, they threw toilet paper instead of streamers to show just what they thought of that person. Uh, the ticket lottery system is something that really changed my experience. So before I was saying how far back I was sitting in Kanazawa, but once I learned how to do the ticket lottery, um, so for New Japan, my promotion of choice, um, you join the fan club, you pay a monthly fee, and the biggest perk is that you get um, entrance into a ticket lottery for specific sections. So in the United States, you usually go to a site at the same time as everyone else. You might be part of a fan club that gets you early admittance, but you can pick what seat you want to sit at, what section you want to sit at. Um, in Japan, what you're doing is it will give you different categories of seats. Um, so royal seating is usually what they call the first three rows, um, sometimes the first five rows, and then it will go um, different floor sections, balcony. Um, so you pick in priority what you want. Um, so I would do royal seating and then the second best and then third option, whatever's after that. Um, and I usually got a pretty good seat. Um, so a lot of times I actually ended up sitting in the first few rows, um, like first row, third row, second row. Um, this one is a really big deal to me on the left because this was actually at Tokyo Dome for Wrestle Kingdom, which is New Japan's biggest show. Um, and I was in the 11th row, I believe, but it doesn't feel that far back. Um, I actually had a really good seat next to the walkway. Um, and it's really cool because Tickets to wrestling shows in the United States um, for major promotions can go into <coughs> the hundreds. Um, for a seat like this at WrestleMania, I don't even want to guess how much I would be paying. Um, I wouldn't be paying the, I, I, I think I probably, I'm, I'm sure I paid less than 200 for these seats. Um, I, I think I'd probably be behind, you know, the, the Titantron, the big screen up front, if I, I tried that at, at WrestleMania. 
Um, so it's a lot more fair um, and it gives everyone a chance to get a quality seat, even if you might not have, you know, um, the time to be there right when ticketing opens, um, which usually happens in the US. Um, as I said before, on the subject of women, um, <coughs> I think that's the biggest difference to me, um, the presence of women in professional wrestling fandom in Japan. Um, this is another shot that you can get a better idea of what the crowd looks like. And what stands out to me is that there are a lot of women in this vicinity. Um, so just circled all around behind cameras, um, looking on behind their cell phones. Um, you see women together, um, women who are alone, <coughs> women of all ages. Um, so the women pictured here look like they're um, 30s and up, which isn't what you get at the average wrestling show. Um, and it makes for a really cool dynamic. Um, I find that with Japanese wrestling shows, you don't get so much of the, <coughs> the negativity um, in the crowd. <coughs> Sorry, one moment. So, in American wrestling shows, um, unfortunately, there can be a lot of moments where um, misogyny comes out to play, comments that aren't very nice, um, attitudes that kind of butt heads with male egos. <coughs> the crowd can get kind of nasty sometimes. But I find that this was always really easygoing, um, really enjoyable. Um, just people enjoying wrestling um, together, which is how I think it should be. <coughs> um, I also think it's interesting. Sorry, one moment. <coughs> I didn't tell everyone this before, but I'm actually sick right now. Um, and I was doing really well. So I, I think um, I can still applaud myself for that, but <coughs> starting to catch up to me. <coughs> but you end up with fun little things like this too. So this was at my local Hyakuen store um, where you actually get nail stickers, <coughs> um, cute little notepads and planner stickers. And all of these things are very obviously marketed toward women. <coughs> um, I also have stickers in the background. <coughs> so I just found that the um, wrestling environment there welcomed um, participation from women and seemed to value that segment of the audience. <coughs> so let me get my coughs out because I feel like if I laugh for this, um, I'm just gonna keel over. So moments of culture shock um, because everything else um, took some getting used to, some things that were really, really cool. Like again, the presence of women in the audience um, and really the place that they had um, in building the audience portion of the show, um, getting used to um, the fan etiquette. So. Um, in American shows, people really want you to be loud um, from beginning to end. <coughs> but for Japanese shows, you tend to be watching <coughs> and appreciating it um, in cheering at moments that deserve to be cheered. Um, so instead of making noise for the sake of making noise, it's really meaningful. Um, these moments of culture shock were just things that I had no idea people did. So the first one is intermission. Um, in American wrestling shows, intermission is a time to use the restroom, to go buy merch, um, to get food. And all of this is true in Japan as well. Um, but there was one promotion that, um, did something a little different. 
So <laughs> both of these examples are from Pro Wrestling Noah, um, which every time I went to them, they had an intermission show. So the first one that I was very confused in texting through was a woman came out. I have no idea who she was. She was very nice. Um, I, I waved to her and kind of talked to her a little bit um, after. But she did a cover of I Don't Want to Miss a Thing by Aerosmith um, and a couple other songs. It was very unusual. Um, that has never, ever happened to me at a wrestling show I've ever been to. Um, I'm not sure why this happened. She was selling her CD after. I felt so bad. I don't think anyone bought it. I think everyone else was confused too. Um, so I, I was just a little surprised by that. Um, and then the other show that I went to happened to be at the same time as a judo tournament and so they did a intermission show that was actually really cool but again just not something I expect when I go to a wrestling show but I know now if I go to a Noah show um, there's probably going to be some entertainment that I, I didn't think I would get. The other incident of culture shock was a fan club perk. So this was at a venue in Fukui. I went to see a promotion called Dragon Gate. Um, and Dragon Gate has a very, um, I, I really admire the relationship that their fans have with the promotion um, because even though it's a smaller promotion, um, their fans are very, very engaged um, and very, um, they're, they're always really, um, energetic at the shows. So one of the fan club perks that they had was they had a raffle and the winner um, could sit at ringside um, throughout the show. And not ringside like where the crowd usually is, they pulled chairs up to the ring apron. Um, so on the opposite side where the steps are, they had two chairs right there. Um, and so the winner, um, I think she could bring a friend. Um, the winner sat there with her very fresh looking infant um, right on the ring apron the whole show. And I was so anxious the entire time because I've never seen a child that close. I've never even seen fans that close the entire show. Um, so it, it was a, um, it, it was an interesting moment for me. Um, that I thought this really isn't um, what I'm, I'm used to back home. Uh, so kind of closing out, um, one of the really cool things with Japan and being a wrestling fan, um, it's what wrestling allowed me to do. So one of the things that was really nice was I was able to use wrestling um, to get closer to friends um, and to teach them about this sport that I loved. Um, so even though we were in the context of Japanese professional wrestling, uh, one thing that I found was a lot of my friends, especially my female friends, were very excited about the fact that there were women wrestlers who weren't just there to look pretty. Um, and that was kind of it where unfortunately some women's wrestling in, um, in the United States has uh, that stereotype, but that they're strong women who, like Ronnie Big Bang Nicole said, um, they hit hard. Um, they're very athletic. Um, they're beautiful, but you know they're going to put on a very um, impressive show um, and show you things that are, are going to astound you just with their athleticism. So I was able to bring some friends have them enjoy wrestling and um, talk to them about my passions. So this is another example, being able to bring another one of my friends. Of course, um, the great cornea scratching incident, uh, we followed that up with a, another show at Stardom, um, which is a popular women's wrestling promotion 
And I was also able to bring that love of Japanese professional wrestling back to the United States. Um, so one thing that I didn't touch upon, but people who know me do know is that at the time of the picture that I showed you at the beginning, I was graduating with my master's in English literature. And in literature, I had begun um, really thinking about what I wanted to do with academia and what I wanted to do with my passions. And that is writing about professional wrestling. Um, and so I had written my thesis um, about professional wrestling and masculinity. And from there, um, being a fan of professional wrestling, having time alone with my thoughts during desk warming or just throughout the day and the different situations I found myself in, I started thinking more about my relationship with professional wrestling, um, thinking about how I participated as a fan um, and really absorbing just how powerful um, a good story could be because I think that's where I really fell in love with the storytelling of professional wrestling and the emotion that it could bring. Um, and so these photos I took were um, photos that I just did for fun, but I ended up actually bringing them together for an art exhibition where I talked about um, catharsis. Um, and so these are just photos that really remind me of that strong emotion. Um, and I was actually able to take that passion and apply for uh, entry in um, a doctoral program, which I was accepted into and began to look further into writing about professional wrestling and audience, um, emotion, performance, uh, more about gender, race, all of these things that I really was inspired by sitting in the crowd. So these are a few more photos. Um, this is something that also carried on to my time in the United States. So I still take photos at wrestling shows. It's a great way for me to think about narrative, um, to think about emotion, telling a story, communicating to audiences that are familiar with wrestling and audiences who aren't familiar with wrestling, but of course are familiar with human emotion and stories. And it was also nice to see kind of the full circle moment where I go from being a fan at a wrestling show in Chicago, not knowing what exactly my time in Japan would bring me to seeing someone who, you know, inspired me a lot, which would be Naito um, on a regular basis and being able to see him perform um, in his element um, in some amazing matches that, again, just brought out all of the things that I'm passionate about and furthered my interest and dedication to studying pro wrestling. And so that is the end of that chapter of my journey, but professional wrestling is something that I'm still very passionate about as a fan, um, as a writer, and as a, um, I always call myself a wrestling adjacent personality. Um, so yes, I have started to do some ring announcing. I don't have as much under my belt, but I can say that um, I have some things that I'm really excited about with uh, promotions that I never ever thought uh, as a high school student just hearing about them that I would ever be working with. So if you are interested in that, um, you can always follow me on Twitter at Scholar and Elbow. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Um, it's the page is to my announces and that's specifically where I talk about my announcing journey and I give information about shows that I will be appearing at and what I'm doing. All right, so thank you everyone. All right, uh, thank you so much to Maya and Ronnie for your presentations. Um, it was really fascinating getting, getting to hear like the, the duality of your perspectives. Um, from Ronnie as a, um, as a perspective, as a professional athlete, and from Tamaya's perspective as a fan. Um, uh, Ronnie, you had a nice <laughs> presentation um, on the historical background of wrestling. Um, at, at least from my perspective, I didn't know much about it. So it was really interesting to hear the origins of wrestling and how it evolved into like the modern day professional wrestling that we have today. And it was also really fascinating to hear your perspective as an athlete in Japan, as well as a female athlete of color 
Um, and Tamaya, thank you so much for your uh, excellent presentation as a fan. And it was really interesting to hear about the challenges you faced in pursuing your passion uh, for professional wrestling in Japan and what you had to navigate to, you know, kind of pursue that passion. Um, and it was really interesting to hear the differences between professional wrestling in Japan and America. So thank you yet again for those excellent presentations. And um, now I would like to open the floor to Q&A. So um, anyone who has any questions, feel free to unmute and um, direct your questions to our speakers. So go ahead. I have a quick question for Ronnie. Um, I don't, if, I'm sorry, did you, how did, did you have to um, audition to work in Japan or do you have a manager that said, hey, go do this or how did that happen? Um, at the time, I was actually about to quit professional wrestling <laughs> because I was so frustrated with the culture and the environment uh, here in the state. I was at a promotion down in Hubert, North Carolina, that was run by Steve Perino. Uh, he's a very well-known wrestler. He's actually one of the trainers down at uh, the Performance Center, and his son Colby is a professional wrestler as well. Um, but I was at his promotion and I was at his show, uh, the wrestler I was seeing at the time was like, talk to Steve, tell him what's going on. Um, Steve pretty much said, you need to get out of here. And I was like, um, sir, where are we? Uh, and he was like, no, your style is, it's going to be way better for you over there, just trust me. And I was like, great, <laughs> have a passport, don't know how to get there. Um, I get a call about a week and a half later, Steve had sent my information to a company over there. And they called me um, and I was doing like a random messenger call from some Japanese dude and I was like, oh, silly, I don't know you. Uh, <laughs> so he called back and I was like, hello? And he was like, Nikol-san, uh, Karino-san, send me. And I was like, huh? And he was like, we want you, Japan now. And I was like, uh, what? And so like we had the conversation and they asked me to come initially for a full year. And I was like, um, let's try six months and see how that goes. Um, and so uh, they were like, okay, well, if you're coming here, like we want to change your character. So that's actually where Big Bang Nicole came from because prior to going to Japan, I was wrestling as the She-Hulk of the South. Um, and so they didn't really like that too much. And so they kind of changed up my character work and my gimmick. And it was a very quick process. Like when they said we wanted you, they were like, we need your passport and all your paperwork. And I got it back. like less than a month later and then I want to say the week before I was leaving I told my mother that I was going to Japan for six months <laughs> so Maya you're laughing because you know why I did that <laughs> but like um yeah I didn't have to, to audition or anything now here in the state for those major companies you do have to go through an audition process or like a trial period um where they'll bring you in and kind of put you through the paces or they'll give you like dark matches which are matches that are televised and kind of see how you fit but no they saw my work and they were like we would like you to come and um yeah and the rest is, is history thank you that was yeah I was just wondering about that and um uh, do they pay better there? Do they pay? What's the pay like? Long, long answer. There's more to consider because you're also abroad. So I would say for the time that I stayed, yes, the pay was better. If it would have been one of these shorter tours, it probably would have been about the same as wrestling independently here in the States. Um, but yes, um, I stayed in the dojo, so I did not have any lodging costs. They took care of all of my transportation, so I didn't have to worry about that, at least to and from shows. You know, if I wanted to go to Kawasaki or go to Lapungi or whatever, I had to be responsible for that. But um, they took care of all that travel. Um, they took care of my food for my first two tours, so they would give me a certain allotment of money for groceries so that I would have, um, you know, food. So I had no overhead, so to speak, in terms of, of having money there so yes I, I made like a, a pretty decent amount <laughs> while I was there and then I came back to the states and became a starving artist again <laughs> sorry no camera but I had a question I was always so curious about how the language um, barrier is handled both like beside behind the scenes how they handle coordinating all these international wrestlers working with the Japanese wrestlers and then also 
as a fan meeting the wrestlers? Like how many of them speak English? Are there translators available? How was that all handled? Maya, did you want to start like from the fan perspective? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so that, that's one of the really fun things um, because there's always the same panic in someone's eyes when they see someone who isn't Japanese. Um, Cause it's like, imagine if you are in the middle of nowhere. So like that building in Fukui where you have to go past a field all the way down and this little brown girl just comes out of nowhere and you're just kind of like, um. So I had a lot of the, those moments, but I had some really cool interactions. And a lot of times there won't be someone who speaks English. Um, you know, the first time I met Naito, unfortunately that was the only time um, I've met him. Um, I was shocked because his English was really, really good. Um, and I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, so sometimes you do have those situations where someone's really fluent, um, or you just have, you know, just how you would talk to anyone that you meet in Japan who, if you're not sure how much English they know. Um, so we all know that people study English, but, um, I mean, it's kind of like how I study Japanese. I can understand it a lot better than I can speak it. Um, so I'm going to go really slow and have really basic sentences, but we can still communicate. Um, so a lot of times people were just really curious how I got there, um, how I knew about them. Um, so yeah, it, it was really fun. And I actually, um, got to talk to one of my favorite, favorite wrestlers right before I left in Noah, um, Keno, uh, he's phenomenal. Um, and it's one of those moments where you have enough of language commonalities that you can communicate. Um, it might not be a really um, in-depth conversation, but just the effort and like the genuine connection, I will say, um, no matter how much of the language that we shared, whether it's Japanese or English, they were always very, very genuine interactions that I appreciated. Um, as, a, as a wrestler, I was concerned about that as well, <laughs> uh, because here in the States, even though I am was trained, you don't plan everything you do in your match. Like we really go out there and create it organically. Um, that was not going to be an option, <laughs> you know, um, because there's a danger aspect as well, because certain moves in Japan are named differently. So you really do have to, um, they call it speak which is where you meet with your opponent and you kind of go through kind of what you can do and what you know how to do and make sure things you're saying the same things and meaning the same things in terms of, of mood. Um, planning out for matches essentially is the same as how I learned to do it here, beginning, middle, and end, except in Japan, the middle part, they call it easy. So that's your freestyle part. And that's usually where the foreign wrestlers would get to do whatever they were more comfortable with or what they were familiar with. Whereas the beginning and the end was a bit more structured so the Japanese wrestlers could kind of guide the match in the way that it needed to go. Um, I wrestled with Mima Shimoda, who is Japanese and uh, Mexican, if I'm not mistaken. And so she only speaks fluent Japanese and fluent Spanish, no English. Um, I speak a little Spanish, uh, Japanglish, uh, <laughs> and English. And so, we had to get another trainer to kind of be our intermediary because we literally were having a really challenging time at the start. But then once we got in the ring, um, we knew what to do because we're trained to know what things mean. So when she gives me a signal on my body, I know what she wants me to do. So I don't necessarily have to speak that. I, I just instinctively know that. And that's one of the beautiful things about wrestling and why I hold it in such a high regard is because once you're trained in the basics of wrestling, you can literally go anywhere in the world and you should know how to be able to wrestle with anyone, especially if you're trained well. And so for a lot of those simpler things, we didn't have to communicate. It was just a pure art form coming together. Um, but I had to learn, you know, I'm like, Tamaya, I can understand Japanese actually very well. I can't speak it very well. I can actually write it a little bit. 
um, and I can read it a little bit, uh, but I know enough to get through a match. So if I am with a wrestler who is knows no English and all, you know, all they speak in Japanese, we could we could still communicate and and figure out what we're gonna do. Um, but yes, it definitely was uh, <laughs> a challenge. Can I ask uh -huh. a question? Oh, sorry. No, I'll let Sarah go. Sorry. Sorry, Tamaya. Um, I wanted to ask really quick. Tamaya touched on the like the f like fan culture and like the interactions with the wrestlers. But from the wrestlers' perspective, what's the biggest difference between interacting with fans in the U.S. and interacting with them in Japan? Um, the fans in Japan actually like them. <laughs> I mean, one thing she touched on it briefly. The fans are rough here in the states. Um, I've had some things said and yelled at me at shows that I will never forget just because people take that as an opportunity to work out some of the things they're feeling. It comes with the territory but there are cases like I, I won't wrestle in Alabama here in the States. I won't wrestle in Mississippi here in the States and this is 2021. Do you know what I mean? So you face a lot of that um, but in Japan it's not like that at all. I was um, I replaced Sare, her tag team partner, um, she was tagged with a young girl named Mako, and Sare injured her collarbone, so I had to take her spot in the match. And this was my very first time ever going to Osaka. They didn't know me. This was my first tour. Oh, excuse me. This was, yes, this was the second half of my first tour. You know, hadn't made a name. We did the match, went to the locker room. Um, you were, as a wrestler, expected to go to your merch table right after because that's your, your job to interact with the fans. And I had all, there was a line and I was like, they must be here because they think, sorry, you know, left her merch and they're going to buy her stuff or they're going to buy Mako stuff. And they're like, Mako was like, no, they're here for you. And I was like, what? Like, these people don't even know me. Like, what are you talking about? And I started to cry and she's like, Nicole, no, very tough. And I was like, okay, right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Um, but <laughs> it was really emotional because I literally never experience that at an independent wrestling show depending on the size of the, the company i could stand at my merch table and a single person they'll cheer they'll scream they'll make all the noise in the world while i'm in the ring but they will not come over to that merch table they will not engage with me at all japan is not like that now there were and i found this more with some of the smaller guys um they were like intimidated because I, my character in japan was very monstrous and i would make a lot of like ah, like crazy monster faces so i would notice people would be very timid at first but then they would see me talking with people and they're like, you're nothing like your character. And I'm like, yeah, because I don't go around growling at people all the time. Like, that's my character. <laughs> I'm really more of an introverted extrovert. Like, but I'm, I'm a low key person. And they're like, you're so nice. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, but you're not in the ring. I'm like, nah, that's, cause that's not what I'm supposed to do in the ring. But the interaction and the appreciation that they show, like fans would bring me gifts and like little cakes and little, like when they saw that I posted something on Facebook that I really liked, they would bring it to the show. So I was in love with those, my, do you remember those little orange juices you get from the vending machines? And it was like orange juice, but it had, it was like fresh actual orange juice with little orange pulp in it. I don't know if you ever had those, but they were fantastic. Oh my God. They, this fan brought me like a case of those because I would always post like one after work or working out or like um, training um, or papari water. Like they would always, you know, bring me a bottle of water or something after a match. Or um, one time a fan actually had another fan draw a picture of me. Um, so I had gone out with a fan to a host dinner, which is where like um, fans take you out and like for dinner and sightseeing and all that kind of stuff. And I had gone to um, an izakaya and I was holding like a plate of meat. And I was smiling and the fan actually had another fan draw like me as a cartoon, like a chibi character holding that. And they gave it to me at the show. And of course, I'm like, they're like, Nicole! Like, <laughs> they were always yelling at me. <laughs> I was crying. And they were like, you're supposed to be a monster. Like, we need you in character. Because that's one thing they're very serious about um, is the whole being in character and keeping kayfabe and, you know, um, protecting the business. But the fans there are amazing. Like, I went out to, and they were always trying to feed me. I think because I'm like a bigger woman that they think I eat a lot, but I really don't. But they were always trying to feed me. They're like, Nicole, yes, more beef, mini beef. And I'm like, okay, right, eh, um, next time, more food. And I'm like, no, like, I'm good. Thank you, though. Like, <laughs> but the fans were, they were so embracing. And the differences in Japan, 
if if you say uh, Joshi Flores in Japan, oh, so going now, you know, like that's the reaction you get in Japan. Whereas here, uh, you say, oh, I'm a I'm a professional wrestler. Like, oh, do you know John Cena? Bitch, do you know John Cena? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it's just kind of like I get tired of. Like what? No, like I'm not. There's levels to it. As whereas in Japan, it's still in the culture and respected. Like Kamai was talking about, you can buy Japan stickers and nail art and decals. Like they had a giant cutout of one of the um, Noah guys in one of the kombinis, and it startled me because I thought he was really there. And I was like, oh, no! oh, that's not you. You're cardboard. Um, but like they really wrestling is in the culture, so it's mainstream. Whereas here, it's almost still kind of niche. You know, because you, you know, people know, they know WWE, everybody knows WWE, whether they watch it or not, but you have, you have people who are diehard wrestling fans here, whereas everyone in Japan is almost a wrestling fan to some degree, because there's, like somebody was talking about, there's so many shows, because there's so many promotions that are almost like um, local leagues or local teams, so like how we would have a smaller home team basketball league here, that's kind of how it is in Japan, they have these little promotions everywhere, so everyone gets open and aware of wrestling from birth essentially and so it's so normal you'll see advertisements on the train i remember the first time i saw myself on an advert for wrestling on the train and i just looked up and i saw my face and i looked back down at my phone and like looked at my face because i guess i didn't process that like that was me and then i looked up again i was like <laughs> and then this lady was like and i was like i know I am here, I'm here. <laughs> but they they wrestling is such a part of everything that they do um you know it's it's in everything in media like the fans just because of that they lavish love and you know gifts and just want to be around you and know about your experience there and it's with wrestling so it's a really engaging community um and honestly it's a less curvy community i'm just gonna keep it hot I, i've gotten more penis pictures from the states than i ever got from japan the one I did, the one or two I did get, they apologized immediately after, which was also confusing to me, but, you know, at least they apologized. But it's also more of a respect thing from the men there, because I, I don't feel as objectified, essentially, um, working with the male promoters and the male fans there as I do here. So it's definitely a better experience for me. And I wrestled in China as well, and it was, it was similar in China. Can I follow up with that? Because I, I think that's something really cool that I didn't get a chance to touch on. I mean, I, I spoke so much, so I, I feel like I sh probably should have been able to fit that in. But the community that you find in professional wrestling, um, I actually think I had a better experience in Japan. Um, because again, in the United States and in Japan, I go to all these shows by myself just because I love wrestling and I don't really have friends that like wrestling too. So if I want to do this, um, I'm going to do it because I'm a grown woman. Um, so I go to all these shows, but um, there really isn't that sense of um, community. Um, I find that in the United States, it's typically um, really clicky you know people go to the same shows and they know each other um they go with their friends and they kind of make a scene um amongst themselves but you're not really talking to the person that you don't know sitting next to you um and you know you're not really trying to help them or anything like i i've met some nice people but that's just generally not as much of the experience that i have again um i find that there's a lot more negative behaviors. You know, you get misogynistic things. Um, you know, sometimes the crowds are a little racist. Um, <laughs> you, you just get kind of, um, you know, just guys being meatheads. Um, but in Japan, I was really surprised um, because although I did have moments um, that were kind of racist in my everyday life, um, in wrestling shows, people really tried to help me a lot. Um, they, I, like, I remember one time um, at uh, Karakuen, I was trying to go buy merch and Karakuen's really weird because it's in a building on multiple floors. So you have to go up, <laughs> like I, it, it, the venue's on like the fifth floor or something weird like that. Um, and so there's merch outside, but for something like New Japan, 
you're not going to fit all your stuff there. So they had another level. Um, and I was just trying to like be brave this one time, find merch because I really wanted to buy stuff. Um, and I just, there were just so many bodies because it's such a crowded small place. Um, I found myself in a line that was like going downstairs and this and that. But I was like, I think this is it. Because again, I don't know J Japanese. I can't read. Um, my, I, I, my reading abilities are very low and like they're not speaking to me. Um, they're using kanji and things that like I don't really, that's not in my vocabulary. So I'm standing in line, um, not really sure. And this woman who really doesn't speak English, um, she's just like very slowly like communicating to me that like, this is the meet and greet, <laughs> the, the line that you, you're in, you can meet. Um, and she's telling me like all the wrestlers that are there um, and like where I should stand if I wanna go meet this person. And that wasn't part of my plan, but I was like, I mean, while I'm here, I might as well. <laughs> Um, or even just, you know, sitting by someone at a show um, when you see that you're cheering for the same person, you know, someone who will get really excited um, and you have, you know, a seat buddy throughout the night that when something happens, you look and you talk to and it's like, you know, we might not be able to have huge conversations, but fangirls like a universal language. So you could still get excited together. Um, so I had really cool moments like that where I just genuinely had fun um you know and even like seeing people from show to show in kanazawa um you know the same group of people were just like me any wrestling that's gonna be there they're going to um and so you get you get these familiar faces um and so yeah i just loved the sense of community that i found there as a fan um i wasn't treated differently in any way um, I wasn't treated like I was special. I wasn't treated any worse for being American, for being black. Um, I actually never surprisingly felt singled out um, for any of those reasons. Um, and I felt really comfortable as, you know, a lone black woman traveling and going to these wrestling shows alone, um, which isn't always the case in the United States. <laughs> No, I was, I was been like talking to you the whole time and then I was like, oh, she can't hear anything I'm saying. But you like, to piggyback off what she said, I honestly, I told someone and they were like, what? And I was like, being in Japan and wrestling in Japan was the most black woman I've ever felt in my entire life. Because I didn't walk into a place where everybody turned and looked at me like, why are you supposed to be here? They literally were like, you're here, whatever. And then it was like, you're a wrestler. All right. Existing in Japan in that space and just feeling what Tamaya was talking about like as a fan because a few times I would go to well not a few times uh I was the resident Noah yeller most of the fans began to recognize me because I would scream so loud for Suzuki and Noah Fuji who are two very well-known wrestlers there um but going to shows as a fan like she said you meet people and when they see you cheering for the same people they'll like look at you when they see something cool happens or you know they'll be like oh did you see that like they want to make sure you're having a great time and it's not um, as isolated as it here is here in the state. You know, it's like I'm with my six friends, and we have a six friends in a wrestling show. It's like we're all here. Like let's all have a good time. Whereas in Japan, it's like we're all here at this wrestling show, and the atmosphere is very different there. I can say that one thing as I was in the past life, I was a bartender, so I have a spidey sense. I call it my bartender sense, where the energy in the room changes. In Japan, you feel that all the time and it's coming from the fans because they're creating this kind of mystical bubble where everybody's just invested in what's going on. Everybody loves what's going on. Everyone is supporting what's going on. And so it creates this real palpable happiness, like effervescent energy. So there was a big match between Ricochet and Will Ospreay that took place at Corican Hall that people over here in the States went crazy for. Well, I was actually there for that match and it was just like, tiny seahorses all over the like it was it was incredible to see these two athletes going at it and I'm a wrestler and I was in the I'm like Come on. like it was just what the story that they told the atmosphere that the fans created in that huge place the court can hold what like 2000 Samaya maybe a little bit more with if they were standing so it's oh like, yeah with the standing because the standing, up on the ledge. yeah so it's a it's a decent size you know venue and just everyone 
at one time being in the moment. I mean, it's honestly how I imagine concerts were, you know, back in the 90s, you know, before social media and everybody was on their phone. Because even that was something that I know is different. People aren't really on their phones as much in Japan. Like here in the States, it's almost like everybody's watching the show like this. And I'm like, how are you seeing the show when you're like, you know, but like in Japan, people may take photos, but most of like she was saying, they have cameras, they're taking mm -hmm. photos, but they're engaged in what's happening. And that engagement, it just creates such a wonderful atmosphere for storytelling and a really comfortable um, atmosphere as a performer, because even though we're not speaking the same language, I know these people are here behind me. They care about what I'm doing. They're rooting for me when I lose and they're impressed by what I'm doing because they show that in appropriate time not just screaming just to scream or because you're even all your friends are wasting want to hear more it's like there was one occurrence where there was a group of foreigners that came into Corican and started to do that and myself and a couple other foreigners asked them to leave because that disruptive to the environment girl I got on you know me like don't come in here disrupting we're especially as a foreigner I think that very seriously they already think not great things about America we don't need to go to other countries and make it any worse so let's act like we were raised in a home and with some sense and enjoy the show together. But there was never that sense, like when you go to a show here in the States, like something's gonna happen, I need to be on alert. I never felt that. I always felt safe and comfortable, you know, in, the, in that environment because people were there for wrestling to support you. And like you said, to have a good time. And I think that's one thing that's lost here in the States. Nobody wants to have fun with wrestling anymore. Everyone wants to be kind of a wrestling expert or I know all the behind the scenes dirt or, you know, look at me, I'm a dirt sheet expert. And I'm like, great, come take these bumps and like get body slam a couple of hours and then we can have a conversation. Like, I don't, I want to have fun with this and I want you to have fun with this because I have fun. But here in the States, it's kind of hard to do that. So Japan definitely sets itself apart by that interaction and by the fact that your fans become your family. Like I'm still in contact with fans from there and I haven't been since 18. I still, like, we still check in on each other. They still, like, when my mom passed, a lot of them messaged me, and they were like, we're so sorry, you know, about your mom, and they were sending me messages. Um, my trainer, when I lost my mom's dog, right after that, she messaged me, because she had lost her dog while I was in Japan, and, like, I helped mm -hmm. her plan a little funeral for her dog and everything. Like, you become so connected to people through wrestling, and I honestly hadn't had that experience anywhere but Japan, because such a normal thing you know and it's so customary to them it's like oh you're a part of our family already because you love us so sorry i know that's a lot and i know we have to get you off know. <laughs> no no oh sorry no i'm sorry i'm the one that's going to make this even longer because as you were speaking you were actually able to voice what i wish i could have articulated when i said how being a fan of japan inspired me because it was that connection that storytelling that I couldn't feel in the United States um, because I had been going to live shows um, in the United States um, I'm not a WWE fan but I would go to um, Ring of Honor um, which is a larger now not independent wrestling show but it was a bigger independent wrestling show that's now um, been bought out it's bigger now um but I enjoyed it but I never felt what I felt in the wrestling shows in Japan and I think it is that connection I don't know how to explain except it's electric like it's like everyone is in tune you can feel the emotions just kind of flowing throughout the crowd um like the picture that was sent out for um this promotion um, that I used at the front. It's one of the best, if not the best wrestling experience I've ever had. Um, and it's, it's not isolated. I had similar ones, but it was um, at Dominion in Osaka when Kenny Omega won the belt um, against Okada. And what makes that so powerful is I had been to um, the previous, because they had a series of three matches um and that was kind of like the final showdown um and the tension in that arena um was incredible i don't know how else to describe it except it was very loud it was very back and forth we were jumping on our feet we had so many times when we thought we knew 
who was going to win, who we wanted to win, um, you know, who we thought was down. Um, it, it ended up being one of those moments where everyone leaves and you're all just like talking to each other because you experience something together. And so to go from that to this last match where again, um, the previous match was in Osaka um, in the Edion Arena and being in Osaka again, you get a lot of the same people. And one way that you can tell that is by fan photographers. Um, it's kind of cool when you can see someone shot and you can say, oh, that angle's a little different from mine. They must have been sitting here. Or you can see um, the shows that they were at um, based on what they upload. So you know a lot of the same people are going. Um, but it, it was just, I don't know how to explain it. Um, I guess other than that feeling of catharsis that I talked about with that um, exhibition that I, I put together. Um, it, it was a very emotional experience of storytelling. Like I legitimately had a tear in my eye watching it because of just what the story spoke. Um, and I don't think if I had, if I hadn't felt that, I wouldn't be so passionate about exploring storytelling um, in professional wrestling. Um, and I, I don't think I would know what to look for and how to be in tune in an American audience where you have to make your own bubble to be able to experience that. Um, and so that alone was completely, you know, literally life-changing for my relationship with professional wrestling, my view of professional wrestling. Um, it was just incredible. I've never felt anything like that again. It's hard to come by. Real quick, sorry, not, not to interrupt. I just wanted to say that um, it is technically past the time that we listed on our guest list. So if anyone needs to exit, um, I just wanted to let you know that you're free to go. Um, however, you know, if Ronnie and Tamaya, um, you know, um, if you'd like to stay and discuss more or answer any more questions, um, you know, I'm free, I'm free to keep the Zoom room open. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, Ronnie and Tamaya gave excellent presentations. Um, I don't know about you, but I learned so much from them. And I just want to thank them so much for dedicating their time to be here because I know they're both very busy people. And I know it's Maya um, had a little bit, you know, she wasn't feeling her in tip top shape. So I thank you so much for being here tonight. And um, I'm going to plug some um, plug some events. So Jedi Chicago has some events coming up. Um, so this coming Tuesday, we have our next Japanese language series event on Pechacucha night. So there will be room, uh, rooms open for different language levels. So you're free to come, whether you're a JET alumni or not, you're welcome to come and um, and practice your Japanese with us. Then on the 27th of August, we have our um, last survival series event for outgoing JETs um, discussing COVID-19 and culture shock. And if you're an alumni, you're welcome to come as well and help guide the, uh, help guide the outgoing JETs and give them advice. Then on the 29th, we have a uh, book discussion with uh, um, alumni Joe Palermo. He is going to talk about his book, No Pianos, Pets, or Foreigners, which discusses his time in Japan during the 80s. And then finally, we have Jedi Chicago's open board meeting on September 13th, which um, you know, alumni in the you know, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Illinois area are welcome to join and hear what, you know, what we have planned for Jedi Chicago. So that's what we have coming up. So thank you so much for attending tonight. And uh, like I mentioned, if you have any remaining questions for Ronnie or Tamaya, you know, when they're willing to stick around, you're welcome to ask them here or you're welcome to direct them to me um, and I can send the questions on to them. So thank you so much everyone for coming tonight and I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday and a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. That was really good, thanks. And All thank right. you Ronnie. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, <laughs> When I was there, I don't know, in the late 90s, if it, it even was like this, but I'm like, oh, I missed out when I was there. Because I didn't do any wrestling stuff. I went to school. You guys one. definitely check it out. Definitely check yeah, it out. And, um, I will. And I dropped my link for you so you guys can connect with me. And thank you guys so much for, for having me. Um, and yes, everyone, please be safe as well. Yes, thank you so much. We really appreciate um, the time you dedicated and all of your hard work. So thank you so much and um, have a great rest of your nights. Bye, Bye guys. Have Bye. a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Enjoy training. <laughs>